Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning for those on the West Coast. Um, we will be getting started in just a few minutes. Just going to let a couple more folks um, join us. And then once we get started, we'll have Ariel from the National Center for Equitable Care for the Elders, um, for the elderly rather, come on and talk to us about um, the content for this module. So just a couple more minutes. Testing, testing. All right, so I think we are all set. Ariel, if you want to um, take it away. Okay, thank you so much. So as Emily said, my name is Arielle. I'm from the National Center for Equitable Care for Elders, and I'm here with um, my other colleagues on my team. You might have heard from Dr. Reedy um, in an earlier module, but I'm a brand new program manager, and I'm very excited to be with you all for this learning collaborative on developing cross-sector partnerships to improve health outcomes. Um, we're going to be leading the charge on this third module today, focusing on building and sustaining community partnerships. By now, you've known a little bit about the SDOH Academy. Um, as always, questions are welcomed. Um, you should be familiar now with the GoToWebinar setup that you can type in uh, in the questions pane if you have any questions or comments. Um, we'll have a couple time for discussion, um, so feel free to chime in. Um, but you're also welcome to chat with us on Slack. For those of you who are active on it, you might have seen the resource that was posted a couple days ago on what successful health-related community partnerships have in common, which gives, I think, a good kind of overview of some of the things we're going to touch on today. But since we don't have all the time in the world, and there's a lot of resources about maintaining um, and evaluating partnerships, I'll we'll be sure to post a few more resources um, by tomorrow morning. So be on the lookout for that on the Slack. Um, like I said, this is module three. You can see the schedule here. Um, I know that Emily's made recordings of the first two modules available already, and there'll be another recording coming to you shortly. Um, you'll see that our last module is next week, um, and we'll definitely want your input as we're going to be working on case studies together. Um, Emily and Saki can speak a little bit more to that when we're wrapping up today. Um, so you can see on the slide, this is our basic agenda. So again, there's a lot of information out there around how to manage partnerships, but we're going to kind of think about it in three phases, um, whether it's the beginning stages of uh, working on nurturing a partner relationship, um, maintaining existing, existing collaborations, and just a little bit on evaluating those partnerships. Um, but again, we'll put more resources on Slack and we can continue conversation there if questions come up. Um, after that initial overview, we're going to have an example of an effective community partnership. Um, Camila Najib Wakab is going to be talking about um, the partnership with Lyft that her um, organization, Peninsula Volunteers, um, has uh, specifically with their senior center, Little House. Um, and then we'll move on to questions and discussion and then be on our way. So you might remember seeing this um, from module one. Uh, the group was asked, even before I came on board here, uh, what organizations do you currently collaborate with? Um, you can see that there's a really strong representation here from healthcare and academic institutions, um, as well as other nonprofits and, and even some faith-based organizations. Um, we kind of continued that conversation last week, talking about mapping out medical neighborhoods and potential partnerships there. Um, these were some of the additional things that were brought up, either um, collaborations you were already experiencing in your community or those that you think would be helpful in a medical neighborhood. Um, it can be really great assets in a partnership when, if you're, when it's geared towards the health of the community. Um, it could be community centers, transportation services, which we'll hear even more about 
at the end of our presentation today, um, as well as food banks and interpreter services, all potential really um, helpful partnerships to have. Um, what if, I don't know, sorry, I'm looking at, yeah. All right, in keeping with the transportation theme, um, I wanted to start with this uh, present session by really highlighting the importance, importance of partnerships um, when you're working towards better health uh, in your communities. Uh, based on our previous slides, highlighting both your current and desired collaborations, um, this isn't new to you that, that partnerships are important, um, but it's a nice image to think about them being effective vehicles for collective action. Um, when approached in the right way, we can really accomplish more together than we can on our own. Um, so not all partnerships look alike, and I think it's helpful at the start to really make a note that there are different levels of interaction that your health centers could be having with any of those other community organizations. There really could be benefits to any of these stages, so there's not really one right way to have a partnership, but you can see where maybe some of the beginning stages would be um, in networking, moving on to coordinating, cooperating, and then perhaps even collaborating. You might be able to envision that over time, you could go really grow from just exchanging information with another organization or service to really sharing resources or even rolling out new projects or services together. Um, so we know that partnerships are important, but that does not mean that they are easy. Um, we're going to take a moment to do a quick poll to identify some of the tricky spots that you may have encountered while trying to build or maintain a partnership. Um, Emily is going to help us get a poll going. You can kind of mark um, anything that applies, and if you have something, a barrier that you've experienced that's not listed, please just type it in the question box. That'll be sort of, sort of as our other option. You can take a moment if you have been working to build or maintain a partnership, have you encountered any of these challenges, whether it's buy-in and commitment, uh, perhaps communication, division of responsibilities, uh, finding sustainable support or funding, and then evaluation of that partnership. Curious to know what you guys think. Emily, you'll have to help me kind of know when the best time to close the poll and let me know <laughs> what our results were with that. Emily, I'm not sure if it's just me, but you were breaking up for me. So I'm not, I apologize if everyone else was able to hear it clearly. Any better? Just a tiny bit. You're still kind of breaking up. So strange. Is that any better? Uh, a little bit more. Yeah, we're we're making we're making progress. <laughs> oh no. All right, there is the result for you. Oh, right. I don't know. Um, again, I apologize that I am so new and looking at this platform. I can't quite see the poll results. Could, Emily, could you let me know what they are? Sure. Is anyone, are you guys able to hear me? Uh, yes, uh -oh. a little better. Okay, sorry about that. Um, let me know if it goes out again. So it looks like the majority of folks um, selected buy-in and commitment and or um, sustainable support and funding. So that was the majority. Okay. But we also had um, we also had folks who selected the others as well. But buy-in and, and then funding were the two biggest ones. Yeah, yeah, okay, makes sense. Um, we'll try to cover all of those in, in you know in small ways and again we'll we'll make sure that the group gets some more resources after but thanks everyone for sharing um your experiences certainly um let me make sure i can get to the next slide um encountering barriers on your way to having productive and meaningful partnerships is really common and very normal um so even if it's frustrating you uh you certainly have other folks who lived through the same um experiences I have a quote up on the slide from Arthur Himmelman, who's a consultant who's I think primarily known for his work around community and systems change collaboration. He kind of summed up the most common barriers to effective partnerships with three T's, uh, time, trust, and turf. 
think that roadblocks to effective partnerships may be a result of limited resources or a lack of understanding or openness in new relationships. Um, the idea of turf sort of comes into play when there are concerns or sensitivity around who has to do what or who gets the benefits. Um, when those issues arise, it can get uncomfortable and it might keep a partnership from growing properly. Um, so thankfully, these are all barriers that can be overcome or even avoided, but we'll go through uh, the basic stages of how to maintain a healthy and effective partnership uh, now. All right, so I know that some people expressed some barriers with buy-in and commitment. So when we're in those initial stages, um, again, we're scratching the surface here on some best practices, um, but we'll try to uh, try to focus on when a decision has been made to have a partnership that's rooted in a shared vision, shared values, um, speaks to the mission of all those who are represented. Um, a great first step for any organizations agreeing to partner together on a project or for a cause is to clearly define each of your roles. It be really important for those roles to be realistic and achievable for everyone. can help avoid some of those barriers that we just talked about, perhaps not having enough time or feeling like the work is imbalanced. Um, building trust is really foundational in nurturing new or growing partnerships. Um, open communication can help to encourage that to really develop. In addition to being upfront about each organization's interests and overall capacity, outlining a really clear plan around how goals will be set and how decisions will be made in the future leaves nothing up to the imagination. So open communication from the start will help avoid members of a partnership who either are not comfortable enough to fully participate or contribute, or on the flip side, want it their way or the highway. Um, it's also really important to value the differences that are around the table. A collaboration that has a really wide variety of perspectives and life experiences is going to be able to effectively speak to the needs of the population that you're serving as a whole and not just one part of it. Um, and our own participation in a partnership with folks who have different backgrounds than our own can allow for some good personal growth and an expanded worldview. Uh, so that shared vision and common goal that often sparks a partnership can help to shape the way the group talks about its mission and approach. Certainly speaking the same language doesn't mean we have to have the same perspective, but it does require the collaborators to come to an agreement about how they define and talk about their work amongst not only each other, but the larger community. Again, being really clear and decisive about your approach can help save some hassles later on with some of those common barriers to those effective partnerships. And finally, it sounds so simple, but it's important to note, everyone's really got to show up uh, for a partnership to work. Being present in the community that you're working for and staying engaged in the work that's happening will help give helpful insight for any of the decision-making processes the group might be tasked with. All right, so once everyone's on board and ready to tackle your goals, um, it's essential to have clear ground rules. So this speaks to the open communication that we referenced on the last slide. There shouldn't be any confusion about what your standards of conduct are, how often you're meeting, what tasks are due and when, and perhaps what the best referral system looks like for certain services. Um, while everyone uh, involved in a partnership plays an important role, it can be helpful to identify and maintain a core leader or leadership team to keep track of goals and be committed to navigating the group through a landscape that often encounters pretty frequent changes. Uh, these folks, uh, these are folks who can take a more active role in identifying future projects and collaborators as well, potentially even funding. So we um, got a couple of folks saying that sustainable and sufficient funding could be a barrier to some partnerships, um, could definitely be a challenge for folks. We don't have enough time to do a deep dive on that today, um, but a, an essential best practice in maintaining a partnership over time is to aim for multiple sources of support. Um, especially when things are changing. Uh, and when working with just about anyone, it's possible for a conflict to arise, but maintaining healthy partnerships requires tackling some of that conflict head on in order to avoid long-term consequences. So those leaders might need to embrace some short-term discomfort um, by talking through disagreements with the goal of ultimately getting back on the same page. Uh, another aspect of that all-important open communication is to ensure that 
there are opportunities for the group to give feedback and to make efforts towards change when any concerns are identified. So depending on the size of your group and the projects that you're partnering on, this might happen with more casual asks or a scheduled time for reflection. So the core leadership or the partnership as a whole um, may not always get things right. Um, you're human, especially if you're new at the work that you're developing. What matters most is a willingness to revisit a plan or an approach and make the necessary changes and keep working towards your agreed upon goals. All right, so when it comes to evaluating those agreed upon goals, there are quite a few approaches depending on your size, resources, the expectations of your stakeholders. I'll be posting, like I mentioned, at least one guide in Slack before tomorrow morning that's dedicated to the fundamentals of evaluating partnerships um, from the CDC that's very helpful. So I'd encourage you to take a look at that to really dive into the outline and design that goes into a formal evaluation. So wanting to bring up just a few basics to keep in mind for now. We have the questions on the slide about what targets do you want to reach and by when, but I also think that even the first question to ask would be, who is the evaluation for? What do they want to know? Painting an accurate picture of how well your partnership is doing relies on clear groundwork being laid in the nurturing and maintaining stages that we've already discussed. Uh, when there are very clear objectives and all involved in the partnership um, continue to be on the same page about your approach and achieving them, uh, you or perhaps more former, for, formal, excuse me, evaluators would be able to look at your progress over time. Again, the actual evaluation questions being asked and data being collected is going to depend on a lot of factors for the organizations, in, organizations involved, uh, but including everyone at the table in that process in some way can continue to help strengthen the rapport that you have. Uh, there will likely still be a need for core leadership to oversee the process and communicate to the group how much time and analysis the evaluation will require. Um, and when you have a partnership, which most of you um, on the call would, uh, partnership focus on better health outcomes for a specific community, it won't actually focus on, won't result in rather claiming sole credit for a long-term positive change that occurs in your target population particularly if there are other organizations or campaigns working toward a similar goal, that certainly doesn't take away from the collaboration's contributions to that wider goal, and an evaluation can help identify uh, the more effective short-term efforts that are being made. And of course, the results of an evaluation are meant to be learned from and shared with others. There might be several groups represented in an interested, invested audience, including your stakeholders, uh, your other group members, potential future collaborators, and anyone else who might be affected by the outcomes. So that's a really high level overview of nurturing and maintaining and evaluating partnerships. Again, we're going to give some more resources um, to speak to the details, uh, but I want to pose some questions, um, particularly to Emily and Saki, the other faculty on the call, but as well as the, the whole group, Kind of thinking about partnerships that you've had so far, what has a successful partnership looked like for you? Uh, and maybe something about any barriers to collaboration that you've personally experienced. Um, if maybe Emily and Saki, if you identify with some of the, the main um, response to the poll question, um, and then would love to also know sort of leading into uh, learning from Camila and her partnership if you've had any experience supporting residents of public housing with their transportation needs through, through a partnership. So it's a lot of questions all at once, but i um, wanting to turn it over to Emily and Saki for a few minutes, and then certainly have the question box open as well for folks to give their answers to any um, or all of these questions. Thanks so much, Ariel. Um, that was a, a really wonderful way to outline um, partnerships and how to maintain and, and nurture those partnerships. I, I just um, we have a couple of things to share. The first is that um, NCHPH worked with NNCC on um, describing partnerships between how, uh, health agencies and housing um, authorities. And we have um, a publication that's available that we can pass around to attendees that kind of describe all of those different kinds of partnerships. I think one of the questions that we often get is um, what is how to develop a formal relationship and is 
uh, you know, what does that entail? Is it um, a memorandum of understanding? Um, is it participation in each other's boards? You know, how do you actually formulate the partnership? What does it look like? And I, I know there have been some, um, uh, you know, rumors or, or questions of whether or not HRSA is going to require PHPCs to have some sort of formal relationships with a housing authority in the future. And that's not what it looks like at this point, but I know that there is kind of this interest in creating um, a formal partnership. And what we found in that case study report that I just mentioned is that some PHPCs do have um, a formal MOU, um, but some of them just have, uh, you know, ongoing conversations and a commitment to kind of keep each other in the loop on what's going on in uh, the communities and by meeting regularly, by serving on similar working groups or, uh, you know, uh, on each other's boards. Um, and once that kind of the relationship has been developed, that um, ongoing communication is, is pretty easy to do. Um, it looks like Emily just added the um, publication to the handout, so you'll have a chance to, to take a look at that. Um, as far as um, uh, you know, partnerships to support public housing with transportation, I think you can think of this in, in two ways. The first is um, getting public housing residents uh, transportation to come to the health center, right? So getting patients there. Um, and to do that, health centers have worked with, um, you know, other nonprofits, uh, the, you know, transportation authorities in order to get things like bus passes um, available to patients um, when they need it to the low income residents or using um, dial a ride services um, to get uh, patients in. And then the other way is, you know, taking services to the community um, in order to get uh, people to access services. And um, one of the things that we found in the case study is that um, either health centers are providing mobile services, so creating partnerships with other um, agencies to get permission to have the, the mobile health unit on their property. Um, or uh, providing uh, health education services on uh, on site in a housing authority. So what we found is, um, as far as like leveraging resources go, a lot of um, uh, um, organizations are already stretched for resources, but what they do have is space. So a housing authority might, or housing development might ha have um, a community room that they can offer to the health center to come and do some kind of health education workshops and sort of nutrition class, you know, whatever uh, the case may be. And so they'll have a lease agreement. Um, and that's the, the way that the formal relationship is made. So um, they'll, uh, in the lease agreement, they'll outline, you know, um, the space that's available, how often it's available, what the use will be. And that's another way to kind of bypass the issue of transportation um, for public housing residents. Um, Emily, do you have anything that you'd like to add? Yeah. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, much better. Okay, good. I switched to a different phone, so clandestinely. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so as Saki said, I, I put that um, uh, document in the handout pane for you all to download and take a look at. Um, I'll also put it in Slack. But, um, I, you know, Saki's points are, are really excellent. And one thing I would add to that is, you know, I think people struggle sometimes to create these lasting partnerships when really we all know that organizations are made up of, of people and that people, you know, people's lives change, they move on from organizations, you know, they might be at the housing authority one day and then, and then, you know, um, change jobs. And all of a sudden that, that relationship that you've had with that person um, kind of maybe, or the relationship you've had with the person doesn't translate necessarily to the organization. So we found that there's, there is, um, that, that that continues to be a struggle for folks to to have that continuity when someone leaves an organization, for example. So I think, um, you know, like you mentioned, lease agreements, MOUs um, are a great way to maybe formalize some of that partnership so that it's at least written down somewhere so that there's some continuity. Um, but that's really one of the main things that I think, you know, we've also heard from folks is that, you know, relationships with organizations are often, you know, between specific people. And if anything, you know, changes in, in that relationship, um, it's difficult to kind of um, 
you know, capture that again with, with new folks. And I'd actually just want to encourage folks um, the attendees, if you want to share any of your barriers or experiences, please feel free to raise your hand. There's that option on there um, on the webinar pane for you, and we can unmute you, um, you know, and, and have you sort of speak to us about that and speak to your peers about that. You can also, um, as Ariel said, put that in the questions pane too. Any any barriers um, that you face, or alternatively, what any successful partnerships that you kind of like to share. Um, so feel free, you know, either now or during our discussion section at the end of the webinar to do that. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, we can certainly give folks a minute, but again, to your point, Emily, we'll have a little bit of time at the end for discussion and we can continue um, the discussion on Slack as well. Um, and again, I appreciate folks responding to the initial poll question to talk about some of those barriers that you might be experiencing already. Um, but would love to hear your successes as well or any other thoughts that you have around those collaborations. Uh, before we transfer uh, to our featured speaker, I want to just review um, a case study that we looked at in Module 2 last week, talking about medical neighborhoods and mapping those out. Um, you might remember this, that Mrs. Rivera lives close to the health center, but without consistent transportation help, uh, she might still struggle to make her appointments. Uh, so our featured presenter today, uh, Camila from Peninsula Volunteers, is going to speak about exactly the type of service that Mrs. Rivera could have used in this scenario, um, safe and comfortable transportation from her home to her medical appointment. Um, so I thought that was a good tie-in, knowing that transportation was a need that was highlighted, I believe, in the initial survey of some of the folks who are participating in this learning collaborative. So uh, with that, I will uh, pass it over to Camila. Hello, this is Camila Naiti Walkup, and I'm the program coordinator for the Peninsula Volunteers Little House Activity Center. And I will be discussing our senior transportation program, which we've had in existence for over uh, three years. Um, a little background, uh, next slide, please. A little background on the transportation program. Um, at about three years ago, we decided to do a, a really comprehensive survey of what some of the challenges are facing our seniors in our community. So we sent out um, surveys to hundreds of residents um, in our geographical area to find out what what was lacking for um, services for seniors. And one of the um, two main items that were on the top of the list were housing, and then the second one was transportation. Uh, we found that a lot of seniors were not making all of their medical appointments or not visiting um, service-oriented destinations because they did not have access to uh, safe and affordable transportation. So with that in mind, uh, we were connected with our um, health district. It's called the Sequoia Healthcare District, which provides funding for different organizations based on uh, taxpayers um, a ta or based on the taxes that they raised from the community to provide services for for health related services. So we worked. Um, that was our first partner. Um, we worked with them, and we decided that a low-cost, efficient ride service was necessary to help address the needs of our seniors. Next slide. So um, after talking with the Sequoia Healthcare District, and they agreed to put up funding for a pilot program to um, see how we could address the transportation needs. Um, next slide. We reached out to um, different rideshare companies to see who would be interested in um, becoming uh, the third partner in this program. And we talked to uh, Uber, we talked to some other companies, and then we um, reached out to Lyft. And Lyft uh, was very excited about helping us um, meet the needs of our senior clients. And so they actually had a business, uh, a business model called their concierge service, which uh which is a which is a desktop application uh for getting wide services to clients um and it's a it's a 
um, akin to their mobile application, but it's designed um, mostly for like nonprofits and other service oriented um, organizations to use for uh, for transportation services. And so basically they base, we basically um, installed their software program um, on our systems at Little House. And we were able to provide riders with um, fast, within minutes of them calling here, a fast and a low cost rides for their doctor and dental appointments or to the senior centers uh, within the area. Next slide. So basically, um, we were able to provide a low cost service, which the Sequoia Healthcare District helped subsidize. So we, so our riders only paid between four to eight dollars for their rides to their doctor or dental appointments, and then the rest of the ride um, that this would charge would be subsidized by the healthcare district and other funders that we um, sought out um, subsequent to this program beginning. Um, it was very efficient. Um, the rider would just call into Little House and say, hey, I, I live at X address and I'd like to go to my doctor. And with our um, concierge lift service, we were able to um, go into our uh, database, um, get access to that person's information, and then send out a driver to that person's house within five to 10 minutes of them calling. And then the same would be on the way back. They would call us from their doctor's office and say, hey, I'm ready to be picked up and taken back home. And so they were, so, so one of the things that we found is that the riders were very, um, they felt more comfortable and safe calling us and giving us their, uh, you know, we they would give us their credit card to put on file and we would charge them every day after the ride uh, was completed. But the riders felt comfortable calling the senior center because they know us more intimately and they knew that we would be tracking their ride and making sure that they got to their destination safely. And so it was a sense of comfort um, that they were able to have through this service. Uh, and this was different from, you know, having buses which have limited locations or taxi cabs which are more expensive or having to rely on family and friends which, you know, sometimes can be considered a burden having to, um, you know, rely on them. And then the ride share apps and browsers require a lot of technical know-how which a lot of the seniors did not have. A lot of them didn't have smartphones or were uncomfortable using the applications on their phones. And so through our service, uh, those issues were alleviated. Next slide. So in addition to um, having the Sequoia Healthcare District and Lyft, we also um, reached out to other senior centers in the uh, area to see if they wanted to partner with us and allow their um, allow their seniors to use our service. And we uh, linked with two other senior uh, two other senior centers who wanted to participate in the program. Um, additionally, we also had another organization who um, were willing to pay the whole cost of the ride for their seniors because they had uh, funding for that. And so we partnered with them and their seniors called Little House directly to get their rides as well. Next slide. So we did a survey. Um, basically um, asking people who used our ride service to give us feedback on how they how their lives have been impacted and one of the biggest things is that they were um, able to socialize more frequently um, with seniors at and seniors in the rest of the um, larger community at the community centers and they were um, able to get access to more fitness and educational programs and nutritional programs so it really impacted their lives quite dramatically um, and of course with um, being able to make all of their medical and dental appointments that enabled them to have better health outcomes and better manage their health um, issues. Next slide. So the survey um, asked people uh, if it helped 
them maintain their independence, and 90% of the um, respondents say that, yes, it did help them maintain their independence, which is a big factor for a lot of skiers, you know, as you get older, sometimes you can't drive or sometimes you get limited by your vision or by um, lots of other circumstances. And so having this right service available help them maintain a semblance of um, or a significant amount of independence. And they also stated that this service made them feel safer than they would otherwise. So we've had a tremendous um, positive feedback from this program, and uh, it's definitely been a, a, a big asset to, to them. Next slide. So some of the uh, client testimonials included people saying that um, that this service was definitely uh, important to them and that it was great. They they loved having the convenience of having their rides monitored by us and um, had a great time knowing that they could get a ride within five minutes of their call um, and that it helped them, you know, keep a lot of their appointments and so forth. So it was definitely um, a life changer for a lot of people. Next slide. And the only challenges that we've encountered so far um, is more of a technical issue. Uh, sometimes, um, depending on if there's construction going on or if, if someone's appointment is in a large complex, sometimes there's an issue of getting the driver to the a rider, and that's something that we uh, work consistently on with Lyft to help us better make sure that the drivers and the riders connect. Um, our partnership with Lyft has been wonderful because they've we've um, basically have a couple of point people at their organization and a couple of people with our organization who work um, on a weekly or you know bi-monthly basis to make sure that all the issues that we have are addressed and concerned and they um, are always willing to work with us to help improve the service. So that has been uh, a wonderful asset to have um, with Lyft because they have a, they're, I think they have a very community-minded consciousness as an organization, and they definitely are willing to help um, in any way possible to um, make the program a success. Um, and I would say that's definitely true for the Sequoia Healthcare District, since their mission is to um, help people maintain um, a good quality of life and um, with regard to health and other services. And I think that's all for my part. Okay, thank you so much, Camila. Um, I want to make sure that everyone gets a chance to ask you questions, but I mean, how great that Lyft was enthusiastic about um, your proposal and that they're meeting with your uh, point people consistently. Um, I'm curious if you are aware of any barriers or challenges initially when setting up the partnership, maybe not about actually being on board with the idea, but working out some of the details. Do you know if there was any, if there's any challenges there that were overcome? Um, you know, I think most of the, the issues were technical issues. We had, um, there was a lot of um, trial and error figuring out the phone systems, how we would make a dedicated line for the writers to call into the, um, to, to the center to get, um, you know, connected to the, the Lyft platform. So we, it took us a while to figure that out. Um, but once that was underway, um, we didn't have any real major obstacles. I mean, um, like I said, the Lyft, they were definitely, like, they were actually excited to do this program with us. And so they, you know, got their people on board and, um, you know, worked with us very uh, willingly. And it was, it was a, it was like a, a kind of a collaboration made in heaven because every, everybody was like, had the same spirit and intent to provide services for seniors. Sure, yeah. I think that when we asked the group initially today what sort of barriers they've encountered, like buy-in or commitment or then sort of sustainable funding, it sounds like with these partnerships here, um, everyone's really committed to the idea and really wants to make it last, which is great. Um, but yeah, thank you so much again. Um, Emily and Saki, did you have any specific questions for Camila before we open it up to the group? 
I do. Um, uh, I have a quick question. So one of the, um, I think one of the barriers that organizations often face is identifying who to speak to in the, in the partner organization, um, especially if they're not familiar with the, or, the organizational structure. And so I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit to how you figured out who to contact at Lyft and how does the organization, the national organization, do they have regional offices or if there are other um, health centers that are on this call that would like to approach Lyft, who should they be contacting and how did you guys navigate that? Um, well, I wasn't I wasn't personally involved in that aspect of it, but I I'm pretty sure um, the person who was our point person here uh, basically um, emailed the general. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of the name that the 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 name of the person, but they um, emailed the um, Lyft support team and said that hey, look, this is this is what we have proposed do you guys have a system in place to you know help us with this and they were they were able to connect um our person with their um community action i i, I can call it like a community outreach program um and so it was it was kind of like since list had already had their system in place it was easy for us to connect with them and get it started Great, thank you so much. We love, I see that Emily uh, said in the chat box to enter your questions, Any of, anyone out there in the group, um, into the questions pod. Be happy to hear if people have questions specifically for Camila about the Lyft partnership or any sort of other thoughts or questions um, about uh, building and maintaining partnerships. I do have a question, um, Ariel, from Stephen, who asked, um, and this is, I think, for Camilla, um, was there any barriers with Lyft and those who were in wheelchairs? And then did Lyft have someone dedicated to wheelchair drivers? That's a great question. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, actually, um, that is something that, that is an issue that comes up. Um, we, hmm, I'm trying to think of how to phrase this. So. The Lyft drivers, um, some of them um, are okay with taking people in wheelchairs and some of them are not. It's it's a little kind of hit or miss with that. Um, it is something that we are um, conscientious about um, because, because the Lyft drivers are like kind of like independent contractors. They don't necessarily, um, they don't necessarily have a, uh, a I'm not, well, let me let me backtrack. I'm not quite sure what the policy is with Lyft and their their drivers about having or taking wheelchair riders. But when we have someone in a wheelchair, we let the driver know before they take the call, you know. And sometimes um, they will say, no, you know, let's give it to someone else. But for the most part, it hasn't been a big issue, and um, our the people who've had wheelchairs or walkers have been able to get the drivers to help them out. Great. Thanks for that great question. One question, um, Camila, for you is, is there an ongoing um, like contract that, is, I mean, you might have said this and I might have missed it, but is there an ongoing sort of contract in place? Like, did you have to sign um, like waivers or any other sort of um, agreements with Lyft in order to have this partnership? Hmm, that I do not know. Um, I can find that out for you. Um, but yeah, I don't. I know that we have a memorandum of understanding with the Sequoia Healthcare District, but uh, I don't know about any formal agreements with Lyft. Okay. Um, and then that's actually that actually um, links to Regina's question that she had. Um, was there any little liability for for you all? Um, that you had to consider when organizing the lift rides, or do patients assume all liability? Um, and she said specifically for maybe some um, patients in psychiatric care. Yeah, so we, um, yeah, we don't, oh boy, this is another question that I probably should have <laughs> been, I should have briefed myself on a little bit better. Um, that That's something that I could find out. Um, I can find out what, if any liability 
we have. I know that um, Lyft has their third-party insurance um, company available, like if there are any issues that come up. I mean, we've had a couple of times where um, a rider um, got injured in the Lyft ride, and so the um, Lyft handled that situation straight through their um, insurance company. Through so, them. Yeah, and so Little House didn't, um, wouldn't be on yeah. the receiving end of that. Yeah, so what I understand, and this might be wrong, um, and just from my own sort of experience with um, Lyft and Uber, is that a lot of times they do have that insurance kind of built in with their drivers so that if anything happens, there's sort of a, um, you know, within the reason, I, I would assume um, Lyft and Uber will kind of cover, you know, anything that, that occurs. But that's a great question to kind of follow up about, especially if other folks on the call or on the webinar want to pursue that kind of partnership with like a rideshare service in their community? Um, is that something that if you did have to take liability for, you know, is that something that your organization would be um, be willing to do or able to do? So that's a great question. Thanks, Regina. And we can certainly post anything that we hear afterwards from Camila on Slack and make sure that folks get um, more, e more information on that. I'm also curious, Camila, when we just had a question about wheelchair users. Um, so you, um, you're able to tell the Lyft driver that someone might be, um, might have a mobility impairment, but um, what other information do you share about um, the riders? I think we had a question in our little room here about what if someone has a visual impairment, sort of how is, is sensitive health information sort of shared? Um. For the most part, we will just give um, basic information about the um, the uh, about the rider, um, but we'll we usually will ask the rider um, as we're putting in notes to the driver if it's okay to say, oh, you know, the the rider is blind. Can you you know honk your horn or something? So we talk to the rider first and say this okay. is what we want to tell the driver, and then they kind of give the yes or no on that. Yeah, that makes sense. Emily, are there any other questions in the box? I don't see any right now, but um, one thing that I want to, and, and feel free folks to raise your hand or put in the question box here, but I know that, um, Camila, you mentioned having that MOU. I, was it with your local Department of Health? Or with, mm -hmm. oh, with the Behavioral Health Services, maybe? Yeah. So um, I think. I'm curious to hear others' experience about having those sort of formalized um, agreements with partners. And, you know, Camille, if you can talk about who at your organization was sort of responsible for making sure that that, you know, was, was written in a way that worked for you and, and kind of executing that. But others can feel free um, to share their experiences. In the yeah, so we basically, um, our CEO was actually um, instrumental in um, helping realize the, the understanding between the health district and our organization. Okay. Um, so he was he was definitely at the forefront of the process. Um, just I think we might have missed there. your first. Sorry, I think we might have missed your first um, part of your answer there. Uh, who was it that you said? Oh, it was our CEO. Up? Oh, great. The CEO of our organization was definitely a part of the process um, at the very beginning, and so he was um, he was part of the drafting of the um, or or not the drafting, but he was part he he signed and made sure that all of the uh, elements of the agreement were in place. Uh, so it was definitely um, you know a high level. This uh, he was part of the high level decision making on that part. Great. So, um, Ariel, I don't see any other questions at, at this point, but I do want to leave time, if possible, for Saki and um, and uh, you know all the faculty maybe to kind of talk about what we would like to do in the next module. Um, I don't know, Saki, if you wanted to kind of give an overview of what you're thinking for um, attendees to do in between now and uh, next week. Sure, thanks. So we are hoping that the next module, which is on levering resources to expand or promote growth, I, I think that's the title of it, um, 
But we were hoping to get feedback from you all as participants and really engage in uh, uh, discussions with you about your personal experiences. So we're asking everyone to submit a case study um, in brief, very brief, you know, one to three paragraphs long, just kind of outlining some background from the uh, challenges that you faced in developing a partnership, posing a question um, if, um, if you'd like to the group so that we can um, have an opportunity to learn and share with each other. Um, and I think uh, it's on Slack, just like that request is on Slack, and I believe Emily also circulated that to the emails of everyone that's participating on the on these modules. Um, so please just send those um, case studies to us, or you can, um, during the call, I think next week, we can uh, use the raise hand um, option to hear from you. Um, but we really like to focus this next module on um, having a, a conversation with you all. Great, thanks, Aki. And I'll be sending, um, once we wrap up today, I'll be sending the slides and recording for this module um, via email as usual. And I would love, um, you know, please feel free to email us as well. And if you're willing to kind of share um, some of your experiences, we'd love to get this, um, have this module be an opportunity for us to kind of workshop um, some of your experiences, some of your partnerships, so that we can maybe come up with some, um, you know, best practices or some next steps uh, to further those partnerships. So please feel free to email us as well. Um, and then we also might dive into some to some case studies that we have um, as faculty members. So with that, Ariel, I think I'm going to turn it back over to you. Yeah, thank you. There's not much else we can say except for thank you for participating. If you have extra questions for Camila specifically, you can put those in Slack. Um, we can pass them on to her. Uh, and again, um, Camila, if you find any other additional answers or resources, I'm happy to pass them along to the group as well. So we'll make sure that all the information gets to the proper folks. Um, so we look forward to continuing the conversation with you through this week, and we'll see you next week for Module 4. Thank you so much Great. for Thank allowing you, me to be part of this panel. Thank yeah. you. Thank Thank you. Thanks for being here, Camila. Thank you. Have a great Take day, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.